curious to see how the family was doing, I suppose. So these were the events in the next few years. And we lived in Hungary, still in our homes, although most of European Jewry were already carted off in trains to the death camps in occupied Poland. And in 1944, almost to the day, we celebrated Passover just a couple of weeks ago. And you know, 67 years ago in Hungary at that time, we celebrated our Passover. In Hebrew, we say Pesach for the last time. It was our last supper with my family together sitting at a table. <clears throat> so whenever I sit down to the first Seder, the Passover night, and we tell the story of the Exodus, of our, the ancient Israelites leaving slavery to freedom, we cannot help but remember of what really happened to me and my family. So we sit at the table and we ask different questions. Why is this night different than any other night? Why do we eat bitter herbs to remember how bitter slavery is? Little did we know that in Hungary they were already hatching plans how to collect the Jewish people on this holiday the next morning. You see, they always managed to do this on a Jewish holiday. And I'm not sure why, but they knew probably that families will be together or to sort of put salt into the wounds even more. So we have this beautiful table set. And we retired about 12 o'clock, and we knew that next morning we'll get up at a leisurely time and we'll walk to the synagogue. And we, we knew my grandfather, who was an officer in the cavalry in the First World War in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, who fought in, the, in Russia for two years, he sort of said, you know, my grandfather was the head of the family. This is the way it worked in Europe. And he said that we're going to be liberated soon by the Red Army. We only have to hold out a few months. We were that close. Unfortunately, a large, you could say a tsunami arrived and it took us and it dragged us out from our homes. Early morning, two gendarmes broke into our home and they yelled and screamed at us. You have five minutes to pack a bottle, we're taking you away. <clears throat> they didn't need a warrant to enter our home. So what would you do when these things happen to you? My mother said, put on layers of clothing, and she grabbed my little sister. My little sister unit was about eight or nine months old at that time. My father said, put your boots on, <clears throat> and we packed our backpack, whatever we could put in. What would you take when you are being harassed by two gendarmes I had three dogs. I had my big dog, Farkash. It's a Hungarian name for a wolf. He was a big Alsatian dog. He was my dog. That dog would go into fire if anybody would threaten him. And this dog was barking his head off because he knew that something terrible is happening here. Our neighbor, whose name was Ili Klinka, she was a good friend of my mother. She was not Jewish. She came running in and the gendarmes were yelling at her, get out of here, this is not your business. And she said to my mother, Ethel, where are you taking this baby? It's like you're going somewhere that is not going to be very pleasant, it may be too hard. We never knew in 1944, we never heard this word Birkenau Auschwitz. Of course, my mother wouldn't leave the baby and I keep thinking that she left the baby would she have survived? <clears throat> we were hustled out from our home and the gates were locked and the dogs were left inside. And we had to walk the walk from my home to the school where we were collected. It took them about a day to collect the Jewish people from the outlying farms. And we spent the first night sealed off from the townspeople in two rooms, 200 people per room. So imagine you were being yanked out from your home, from your comfort, your bed, your table, your food, and all these things, your freedom of roaming around, and you're locked in into a schoolroom.
with 200 people. They were not strangers, we knew them. But you know, everybody has their own privacy and that was gone. There was no privacy here. <clears throat> it was a very terrible night. I couldn't understand why I'm here and my home is only 20 minutes away. And I kept thinking, you know, we didn't have our second Seder, our second dinner at home. <clears throat> it was so strange. We're not going to go to synagogue tomorrow. What do you think went on in my town while we were sealed off that night? Do you think life went on as normal? Probably. It did. When all the Jews were taken away and sealed up in the school, there was an orgy, an orgy of looting. All the Jewish homes were entered and stripped to the bare walls. That's what went on. The next morning, we were assembled in the schoolyard and we were marched through the town to the railway station. We captured 400 people, old men, handicapped. The rabbi was made to walk in front of the column. He was an older gentleman with a long white beard. This was an exodus. Jews were marched out from my town to the railway station, never to come back. Out of 400 of us that left the town a year later, less than 20 of us that came back. There was only one mother with two teenage daughters. The train took us to Koshitsa Kasha, this big city, where I was an apprentice and we were dumped into a brickyard. This was the next stage of collecting Jews near major railway stations. Everything was done in a very systematic way. Eichmann, who was the head of transporting Jews to the death camps, arrived in Budapest. And he organized, with the help of the Hungarians, the deportation of Hungarian Jews. Living in a brickyard, just picture what it's like to live with 30,000 people in a brickyard. In 1944, the last pool of Jewish people in Europe lived in Hungary. 700,000 Jews, these were the remnants of Jews of any number. And they were so determined. Eichmann, who said he followed orders, He was determined in the last year of war when the entire apparatus was falling apart and he managed to find rolling stock with the four Jews. I mean, cattle cars. And you know, every day living in this brickyard was an ordeal. There was only one tap of water that came in for 30,000 people. You lived in red dust. You came face to face with a communal latrine and there were no latrines for men or women. And I wish that nobody ever have to see a contraption like this. But every day an SS officer arrived at the exact time and he gave us a story. You see, the Nazis had a massive apparatus of propaganda. They made the big lie and people bought it, believed it. This was called brainwashing. You need to be very careful what you hear. You need to sift through it. And he told us the following story. That you're going to be resettled in the East. What a nice word. He didn't tell us you're going to be taken in cattle cars to your death. You're going to be resettled in the East. It meant that from here, we're going to be resettled somewhere there. We thought somewhere in Eastern Hungary. Families will be together, and you will be working on farms. And I know what I forgot to tell you, 42. <clears throat> so I'll just backtrack a couple of seconds. In 1942, my maternal family who were living in Slovakia under a Dr. Tiso, whom I didn't see after 1938, Dr. Tiso managed to ship out the Jews the first Transports were leaving from Slovakia. We received a telegram, it was about May, in the spring of 42. 
from somebody, a relative from the Hungarian side, that they were taken away and nobody knows where. Imagine when this telegram arrived. My mother was devastated, and I was thinking about that to my cousin. It was a very terrible moment. So here I am listening to this SS officer. Oh yeah. Uh, six months after they were taken away, we received a postcard and it said General Lubermann, because Poland after occupation was called no longer was no longer called Poland. It was called General Government. And it had a big eagle on it, a German eagle, and it's a Lublin district, and it was addressed to us by the Friedman family. This was my mother's maiden name. And the message was that we, the Friedman family, were all here together, working on farms, and we are awaiting your arrival. What a wonderful message. While Lord breathed a sigh of relief, I knew approximately where Lublin was. It didn't say Majdanek, it said Lublin. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have known if it said Majdanek. So when you see this SS officer is telling us, that you're going to be resettled in the east, you'll be working on farms, you'll be, families will be together. I started, I remember this postcard, and I kept thinking, I'm going to meet my cousins, and everything will be fine. Transports are leaving, we're loaded and packed into cattle cars, and you know you can write a book what it's like to be packed in with a hundred people or thereabouts, maybe 90 or 95 in the cattle car. You can't roam around. You're stuck in one spot for three days and nights, and you're standing for three days and nights. <clears throat> it's a horrible experience. Initially, they gave us a pail of water and a pail for a toilet. Well, the water was gone within seconds, and the toilet bucket was full, and the door is never opened again, and the water is never replaced. So picture yourself in this cattle car, squeezed in in the corner, and the train takes off. It has a locomotive. It has to produce a lot of steam to get started, and you can hear the steam blowing. And then it gathers speed, and it keeps going and going, and it comes to stop maybe, I don't know, every once in a while, because the locomotive needs more water and coal. And then night comes, and you're stuck in this pitch black. Old people are moaning, some are crying, some are crying. And you're sort of rolling with it as the cattle car is moving. And you can hear the steam engine, and you hear a whistle of the engine. And the train is rushing on, and you don't know where you're going. Your spirits are right down in your feet. The next morning, you've traveled all night, and you said, well, we'll probably get there now. And the train goes on for another day, and another night. And the third night, the train came to a stop. I could hear doors were being opened, and I thought that nothing could be worse than what we had just experienced. 